Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, India's first Future Tech Meets Sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Dr. Michael Fossil, who is a former professor at Michigan State University. He has authored more than 100 articles on aging, medicine, and ethics. He's spoken globally on the subject of aging and is the author of several books on aging, including Reversing Human Aging, The Telomeris uh, Revolution, The Immortality Edge. He's the editor and senior author of an academic press uh, medical textbook, Aging, How Aging Works, How We Reverse Aging and Prospects for Curing Aging Diseases. His academic textbook, Cells, Aging and Human Diseases, reviews the fields of telomere biology and cell senescence as applied to human diseases and aging. He is the founding editor of the journal, The Rejuvenation Research, and is currently the president of Telocyte, a biotech firm targeting Alzheimer's disease, intending intending to begin FDA-sponsored human trials aimed at curing the underlying diseases process using telomerase therapy. So, Doctor, really, really appreciate you taking time being part of the podcast. I wanted to start with biotech, you know, because that's seen some explosive growth in recent years. You know, it's from your CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to regenerative medicine, personalized medicine to synthetic biology. What do you see as the most promising area of biotech innovation right now? And how do you view this advancement impacting healthcare in the years to come? Let me put it in perspective for a second, Eddie, which is that, you know, most people, if we went back 20 years and you said what will happen in the, in the you know, 20, 21st century, and even now most people say this, they talk about computers and AI and, and large language models and so forth. And I think that that's true as far as it goes. But I think if we look back in 100 years, we'll say that the 21st century was a century of biology. And I think we're going to make some advances that most people never really see coming. Um, it, it reminds me of, you know, whenever we go back in history, we find that people think that they've got everything solved except for those last little details. And they're almost invariably wrong. And that was true if we went back 200 years, because people thought that they understood medicine, for example, and they certainly did not. The, the whole microbial revolution had yet to really take off, except in bits and pieces around the world. But you know, really, globally, it hadn't taken off yet. I think that's where we are now with regard to aging and age-related diseases. I think we're about to do something that has never been done in history, which is to actually be able to alter the underlying aging process and the outcomes of clinical age-related diseases. Uh, and that's only part of it. I mean, obviously, when you're looking at gene therapy in general, and our ability to deal with genetic problems, um, biological problems, medical problems in general, there are a lot of uh, obvious um, ad avenues we'll be following up on. But I think that, again, the biggest single revolution will be our ability to deal with and understand age-related diseases, both to prevent cure them. Right. Yeah. So I, I think Dr. V is sitting in such a fantastic point of time. Yes, I think forever we humans, you know, because I guess, you know, when we're trying to kind of create an innovation or research, you know, and when we are the we are like the cusp of it, we think, okay, we understand everything. But you know, I think the world itself is so complex, you know, right? From your physics to biology. Now humans itself, you know, I mean, we've got 3.4 billion base pairs of D DNA and how it interacts, you know, creates us, you know, and th there was that that knowledge that okay, the genes create everything, you know. Then the epigenomes came into uh the, the yeah. picture. So so yes, I guess I mean the more we kind of dig in, we we kind of like uh, find like, oh, there's still, you know, kind of you know more uh you know way, way to go. Currently how much do we actually understand age and are the aging biomarkers uh, the, the right evaluation for, you know, how or, and why we age? I think that in general, no matter what we're dealing with in human experience, it is always more complicated than we realize. And that's true of aging, too. I think that in general, most people have almost no idea really how aging works. They think it does. They think they do, but but they're not thinking about how it really works. And that has impeded any progress. The assumption that you understand something gets in the way of understanding something. Um, <clears throat> but when it comes to aging itself, I think we're making progress. We're beginning to understand the, the, the whole systemic, the dynamic process of it, rather than just it being entropy. Um, and that when it comes to biomarkers, biomarkers are critical, but they don't help you understand the process. Now, let me put that in perspective, too. If I'm trying to deal with COVID, I could say what I need to know is the viral load, the temperature, the, the T cell response, whether you have aches and pains and headache and difficulty with coughs. All of those are important, but they don't deal with the fundamental issue of how does the viral infection work? 
And I think that's true of aging too. So biomarkers and hallmarks are all signs and symptoms of aging, and they are critical to, to get a, a measure of what's going on, but they don't tell you how the process works. I mean, can you elaborate on, you know, how does the process work? Do, how much do we kind of currently understand of uh, aging? Very little, um, at least m most people. Uh, this is a an issue that came to light uh, for me very poignantly at a conference I helped organize in Washington about Alzheimer's disease. And I was to summarize the entire conference at the end of the day. And I, I said, listen, I'm not going to summarize what people said, but let me point something out. We know a lot about upstream risk factors, for example, genetic risk factors, head trauma, infections, microbiome, lots of things we can talk about. Exposure to toxins, radiation, also things that, that have an impact on your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And we know a lot about downstream issues, for example, uh, beta amyloid and tau tangles. And we can go on and on with things that we see, as well as cognitive tests, uh, targeted, MR, uh, targeted PET scans, MRI scans, things that we know occur. What we don't know is how you go from one to the other. We know, for example, that if you have two ApoE4 alleles, your risk of Alzheimer's, both early onset and rate of progression, go up. But why? We know with head traumas, your risk of Alzheimer's goes up. But exactly why? We know with infection and so on. But the question is, what goes on in between? What's in the black box? And that's true of aging in general. We could talk about cardiovascular disease in the same way. You know, we could list dozens and dozens of factors that increase your risk for getting a heart attack. But why did they do that? And we sort of have this vague idea we know, but we really don't. We don't understand the process very well. That I think is our major uh, impediment to progress is understanding that there is a process that doesn't just happen. There's something that happens that's complicated that we need to understand. Once we do that, rather than attacking upstream risk factors, like for example, you know, the cholesterol in your diet or uh, the, the possibility of head injury for Alzheimer's uh, or downstream again, heart attacks for cardiovascular disease or Alzheimer's for, for neurodegenerative disease, we begin to see where we can attack a more effective point of intervention. And for, for me, that's the critical issue. It's not just how it works, but what's the optimal point of intervention clinically and financially? How can we cure and prevent these diseases cheaply and effectively and safely? Right. So doctor, do you think, you know, because you spoke about AI, you know, AI does one thing very well. It takes a lot of data, deciphers or something really useful out of it, you know, bioinformatics, you know, we, we like said 3.4 billion base pairs of DNA. Mm -hmm. Do you think that AI would play a role in possibly helping us understand aging better? No, uh, the quick answer is no. Uh, yeah, to a lesser extent, yes. But, but it depends on your assumptions. So let me take you back 200 years ago. Uh, 200 years ago, uh, the first president of the United States, George Washington, died in about a two-day period of what was probably a strep infection. We'll never know, but but he was treated with enemas and bloodletting. Now, if I had been able to take AI and, and gene sequencing and precision medicine and lots of things back in time, and, and nanocomputers and quantum computing and massive data analysis, back 200 years ago, his physicians wouldn't have gotten any further because they started with some assumption about what was going on, and all they would have done is come up with better bloodletting and better enemas. Well, the problem is the insight and their lack of understanding of the, the basic problems involved. So I don't think AI can look back and say, ah, microbiology. It's human beings who need to step back and say, wait, what's going on here? Now, I say that carefully because there's been a, a recent study just came out in Nature uh, looking at this sort of issue. Actually, it was a preprint. It was discussed in Nature. But, but the question is, can AIs be creative? And to some extent, probably they can. But to what, what extent? How does that go? I think that AI is incapable of stepping back and understanding the whole process of aging because, for example, we tend to ask the wrong questions. We start with the assumption that aging is, for example, just an entropic phenomenon. It's just wear and tear. People get old, they rust, what do you expect? Without stepping back and trying to understand what's really going on. Um, so the problem we have with AI is not that AI isn't very useful. It's that we're not very good at asking the right questions because we make assumptions that are just not valid. Doctor, what are the right questions? And, and you've been invested in this field for the longest time, you know, and it would be great if you could also maybe uh, elaborate on the research work that you are doing. Most people, again, without thinking of it, and this is true within the aging community globally as well, tend to think of aging as wear and tear. And if you push them a little bit, they'll talk about entropy and, and the laws of entropy. And that's all right as a start, because clearly entropy occurs. But the question then is, why does entropy occur in some cases and not others? And it's a little more complicated. Example, you know, every cell in your body, you'd say, is, is several decades old, except you got it from your mother, who got it from her mother, got it from her mother. 
And that line of cells has an unbroken provenance that goes back about 4 billion years. So the question is, why did you inherit non-age cells? And yet in a matter of decades, every somatic cell in your body tends to show changes. Now, some people would say, well, it's, it's the mitochondria, but the same problem occurs. Uh, you know, the mitochondria you got from your mother, who got from her mother, and those go back to something probably a little short of 2 billion years. And you did not inherit age defective mitochondria, you inherited perfectly adequate mitochondria. And yet if I look at your mitochondria now, they show changes that are clearly consistent with entropic change, aging change, whatever you like to say. So the question isn't just, is entropy or wear and tear uh, uh, play a role in aging? The question is, why does it occur sometimes much more than others? Or another way to look at this is, why do some animals age faster than others? Uh, why do some plants age faster than others? So you can't simply wave your hands and say that aging is wear and tear without explaining why it occurs in some cases, not in others, and in some cases faster than others. It is, it is entropy versus maintenance. So the question isn't just, does entropy play a role, but what happens to maintenance? Why does it, in retrospect, work fine for 2 billion years, 4 billion years, and yet clearly it doesn't work for a matter of decades for you and I? Those are the kind of questions that have answers, but you need to ask those questions. And if you just assume that it's wear and tear, you've already cut yourself out from any understanding of how aging works. So you've been interested in telomere research. How do you see the field of telomere biology contributing to our understanding of the aging process? I think it's played a big role historically, um, and it still plays a central role, but I don't want anybody to overplay it. The question for me is, as I say, not um, you know, not does the immune system or mitochondria or DNA repair or telomeres or epigenetics play a role? The question is, once you understand that, where is the most effective point of intervention? I mean, as I used to say to, to my residents and, and medical students and so on, the question isn't, what is the disease the patient has? The question is, what can we do about it? You know, patients don't come in because they want to know the name of it. They want to know if you can make them better. Can you improve my life? I think the same thing is true here. But, so the question is, where can we intervene effectively? And telomeres and telomere biology, I think, play a central role in that because they're probably, and the data supports this, probably if not the optimal point of intervention, darn close to it. It really began almost a century ago with our beginning to understand how genes and telomeres began to work. And, and it progressed particularly in the 90s with our understanding that in 1998, that if you actually reset telomeres, you can reset the aging of human cells. So we've done this and we've done this with tissues now some 24 years ago. The question is, can we do it with organisms? And the answer is, we probably can within technical limits, yes. Is there anybody trying this approach? I mean, is your lab trying to do this? Well, uh, you know, most of the people who've done this have labs. I don't. You know, uh, we're trying to involve taking this to FDA human trials. So it's not a, a lab issue or an academic issue for us. It's a clinical issue. Um, but I think of Ron DePino's lab, who was originally at Harvard and now is in Texas. I think of uh, Maria Blasco's lab in Madrid, who is the director of CNIO. Um, they've actually tried this, for example, with mice. And the data support the, the idea that you can do this. The question is, how effectively, how safely can we do it? And we'll see. What are the challenges in translating this uh, uh, aging research from animal, you know, these, these mice models to human applications? We used to say in Alzheimer's research, and it's mostly true, that everything works in mice and nothing works in humans. And it's not true because most things don't work in mice either. But it is true that it's very hard to go from something that works in mice to something that works in humans often. But a lot of times the problem is we're dealing with mechanisms that aren't really shared. Example, uh, you know, if I'm looking at, at your brain or mine as we begin to get Alzheimer's, we see these beta amyloid plaques. You don't see the same thing in most other species, mice, for example, to dogs to the extent you do, but it varies species to species. So the point is that there are mechanisms that are only partly shared. Pathways of, of for example, amyloid metabolism are not the same in all species. So if what you're doing is trying to translate beta amyloid work from mice to humans, you find there are stumbling blocks, there are problems. On the other hand, there are things that are shared universally, not only among mammals, but among vertebrates and among almost all species. For example, um, you know, the epigenetic changes that occur as a result of telomere shortening. Not universal, but very close to universal. Certainly universal between humans and mice, for example. Um, the, you know, the rate of shortening is different, the telomere lengths are different, but the, the outcome and the way the epigenetic shifts occur are universal. So what I'm saying is that most of the research we do, for example, on, on uh, Alzheimer's, looking at animal models, don't translate very easily. Uh, however, if you're looking at, at telomere biology, it translates fairly easily. Not perfectly, but very close to it.
Right. Uh, Dr. Yu, you're also part of uh, Telesite. Do you think you'd be able to share some of the works that you've been doing at Telesite? Well, what we're doing in Telesite is trying to take this to FDA human trials. Um, and our initial primary strategic target will be Alzheimer's disease for a number of reasons. It's a, it's a fatal disease and uh, 1,500 interventional trials registered globally, notwithstanding, there really is no essential cure, never mind uh, Lukembi and, and anakanumab. Um, they don't reverse, let alone stop the, the disease. So it's a, it's a disease that uh, begs for an answer. And that's less true, for example, of wrinkles or osteoporosis or osteoarthritis, where we have options and they tend to be not fatal. Um, so we've picked a disease, a target, that is fatal and has no real options. So it makes it easier for us in some ways, even though it's regarded, uh, in some ways, Alzheimer's is regarded as the graveyard of companies because of the failure rate. And we think that's because they, they to quote Indiana Jones, it's because they dig in the wrong place. If you dig in the wrong place, it doesn't matter how hard you dig or how deep you dig, it's still a wrong place. We're digging, I think, in the right place. Right. So, wish you and your team at Telesite the, the very best. So your work has touched on both uh, neurodegenerative and cardiovascular diseases. Do you see a common mechanisms of sorts of play in these different manifestations of aging? I do. You know, it, in all cases, when we look at the cells involved, for example, with the brain, if we look at the neurons, microglia, um, I look at dendrocytes, what you see is there are changes consistent with cell aging, cell senescence. And if we look at cardiovascular disease, if you look at the, the vascular and endothelial cells and the subendothelial cells, you see actually the same sorts of changes. That is, senescent changes consistent with changes in the epigenetic pattern, uh, changes consistent with changes in the way mitochondria uh, recycle uh, in the way DNA repair occurs. Um, so the question is, can we use the same approach, that is to reverse cell aging, reverse cell senescence in these as models, and the answer seems to be we probably can. Again, this is based on human cell studies, and we'll see if we can take this to human clinical trials. Right. You had written an article, uh, Unified Model of Dementia as an Age-Related uh, Neurodegeneration. Could you summarize the, the key points of this model and how it might lead to new interventions? Yes, I was asked to write that paper because of the conference in, in Washington I helped organize. Um, and as somebody pointed out, I, as I said, what we need is a model that explains how to go from risk factors to outcomes. And I was asked afterwards if I had such a model. And I said, yes, I don't see any reason to impose my model on other people, but we do need a model. And it turned out the person who was asking me this was the editor-in-chief of Alzheimer's Dementia, asked if I would please write that model up. And I did. Now, he had posed, I think it was 10 key questions and uh, about what we needed to do to be able to solve Alzheimer's. And so I addressed those 10 critiques key questions in terms of my model. And as I say, what my model did was to take upstream risk factors and downstream outcomes and say, how do we get from one to the other in, in a manner that makes sense? And it's a model that's consistent with all the clinical and research data. It's been predictively valid. That is, it predicts ahead of time the outcome of the adenokinumab and Lukembi studies. Um, and I think more importantly, it offers not only a novel point of intervention, but one that's clinically feasible at this time, given the, the tools we have in gene therapy, for example. Doctor, you've also worked with progeria patients. What insights have that research or work provided you to help uh, uh, in your the aging research? Before we move on to just progeria, let me take you back a ways. You know, when I was back in medical school, I was fascinated by the aging process, and I found most people said well, it just happens. To me, that's blasé, and it usually means people aren't trying, aren't thinking carefully enough, because as I said, things are always more complicated than you think they are. But what I noticed is that when I reviewed the literature on aging, age-related diseases, progeria among them, I found that there were a lot of um, what appeared to be blind alleys, or at least alleys that were unrelated to other alleys. So progeria was interesting. Mitochondrial dysfunction was interesting, as there's just two examples, but how did they relate? Um, and I began to take that old analogy of the, you know, the, the blind man and the elephant. And what you found is that we knew something about the ear and something about the tail and something about the trunk and something about the, the leg. But where's the elephant? Um, and so for me, progeria was fascinating because, it, it, you know, as you know, these, these children look like they're old. And they have short telomeres, by the way. They tend to die of cardiovascular disease. The average age at death is about 12.7 years. And they die overwhelmingly, as I say, of strokes, heart attacks. Um, they tend to have no hair. The skin it doesn't heal well. It's thin. Um, it, they have a lot of the characteristics of, that we see of aging. And the question is, does that teach us something? Yes and no. I mean, clearly it's different in some respects because here they are aging at, you know, something in the order of six times faster than you and I do. 
depending how you look at it. Um, but is that aging or is it just, a, a, as I say, a blind alley? And I think that it's a very useful one, um, a very useful insight, because it suggests that, that aging, even in a human context, it may be genetic, but what's the genetic connection? Uh, you know, it may be a universal phenomenon, but why is it faster in these children? And what you found, for example, if you look at these the progeric children, is they do have an abnormal gene, but so what? What does that gene have to do with aging? And that was a little unclear, I think, to many people. And when you tried to just deal with the outcome of that gene, it didn't help. Um, so again, as I said, things are always more complicated than you first think. And yet I think that the insights from progeric children uh, are enormously beneficial to us if we really look at them carefully and try to understand what they mean. So, so, Doctor, I, I think, you know, I mean, like researchers, scientists such as yourself, for the longest time, I, I think have been trying to kind of figure out, you know, this this promise like of like maybe possibly either pausing uh, uh, or reversing aging. Uh, mm -hmm. do, do you have like some like a, like a timelines of sorts, you know, when do you think uh, would it be possible and which which approach you think could could lead us to, you know, maybe like a you know, getting towards uh, uh, reverse aging? I think that the best approach currently is to relengthen telomeres. And to do that, I can think of easily three or four different options to do that. And we're going to have to see which is the most effective. Um, you know, the biggest single obstacle is conceptual, people not understanding what you're actually trying to do. For example, most people don't think you can reverse aging. They think you can replace certain cells or replace certain organs. Uh, an example here would be the use of senolytics. And here that, that approach has been to remove senescent cells. Yes, but that simply accelerates the senescence in the remaining cells as they try to make up for the cells you removed. Um, so again, they're starting with the assumption you can't reverse the aging. They're simply saying, let's take out aging cells. That would be like saying, I can't fix your knee, but I can replace it with something made of steel and plastic. Well, thank you, but what about my knee? Uh, so I think we can do this, but the biggest obstacle is conceptual. After that, the obstacle uh, turns out to be financial. That is finding people who are willing to invest and, and take this to testing. Um, and after that, there are still technical issues. You know, even in gene therapy, there are a lot of unknowns, uncertainties, and risks involved. Um, so it's it's difficult. I think we're about to make probably in the next three years um, the sort of advance we need to demonstrate that we can do this. Um, but still, there are obstacles to be overcome. Still, Doctor, besides waiting for. Uh, the zero scientist working towards, you know, finding an intervention, you know, which could take maybe a couple of years, maybe decades. There are uh, people who are already uh, seen results, you know, with uh, lifestyle changes such as exercise and intermittent fasting. And then there are also these repurposed drugs, you know, such as metformin and rapamycin. Do you follow a regimen? Uh, and is there any advice that you would like to give uh, you know, the 50 years and above on, on possibly maybe uh, leveraging these kind of in interventions? I think a lot of us are aware of the, the routine, not very sexy recommendations. That is exercise, a good diet, avoid stress. I mean, we can go on and on with these things. But while those things may slow the aging process, they don't stop it. And they certainly don't reverse it. Um, I think we can do better than that. So uh, it, I'm perfectly in favor of people being careful what they eat, exercising, on and on. Again, standard advice that, as I say, your grandmother probably gave you as well. And certainly your, any physician probably give you the same advice. Actually, they'd vary for which diet they'd recommend and what exercise. Okay. But the day, the, all those suggestions don't reverse aging. They don't stop aging. They just slow it. And I'm in favor of that. It reminds me of back in about 1952 or so, there was a... a a big movement um, toward having a good diet to prevent polio. In fact, there was a best-selling book about it in the United States. Uh, and it didn't prevent polio. It may or may not have lowered your risk of getting polio or changed your immune response to polio, but it certainly didn't prevent it. What you needed was a vaccine. Very effective. Um, and I think that's where we are with regard to aging now. You can talk about blue zones. You can talk about diet. And of course, that sort of thing comes across my desk every day. Um, but those don't stop aging, they don't reverse aging. So I'm in favor of those, I recommend them, but that's not the answer. That's a stopgap. You've written on the ethical implications of aging research. What do you see as the most pressing ethical consideration as we advance in this field? You know, from my perspective, part of the ethical issues um, 
I see that almost everybody, if I have a, a child dying of gastroenteritis, everybody, I think, has compassion. That's, I think, less true of older people because we all were young, but we don't, some of us don't think we'll ever get to that point of having Alzheimer's or heart disease. And yet we generally do these days. Um, but that ethical issue uh, bothers me because you do see people who say, you know, we should never reverse aging until they age. Um, we should never do anything about interfering. As I used to say, you know, people talk about interfering with the will of God. Well, we do that all the time. If I try to save a four-year-old hitting their bicycle, if I have a 41-year-old woman with cancer, uh, certainly we try to intervene with the will of God because we have compassion. It's not a question of playing God. It's a, it's a question of being human. Today, I think if each of our part is pretty much augmented and the healthcare has added so much layer. And if we didn't have those facilities, you know, we wouldn't have these... Uh, uh, organ transplant, you know, which which can, you know, add more years to our lives. But yes, I think there's a certain kind of population who kind of still keeps on, you know, pushing the, like, okay, this is not right and this is not wrong. So, but yes, I guess we humans, I mean, especially researchers, scientists, yourself, I think, you know, we, we keep on pushing the boundaries and, you know, I mean, making one dent at a time and i'm sure the world will also possibly realize the that the what that uh you know the the goodness in, in the in, in the longer run uh, how do you see the field of aging medicine uh developing in the next decade you know if i look back at the if the things that have most had an impact on human health in history it has not been technical advances. It's not a fourth generation selfless born. It's not robotic surgery. It's not cardiac transplants. Um, it is a conceptual advance, and that is microbial theory. The idea that you should wash your hands before you deliver a baby, for example, did more to lower maternal and neonatal uh, death rates than anything else I can think of. Um, and it had implications throughout. You know, it allowed us to to deal with immunizations and and antibiotics and things and phages now coming up. Um, things that you know we hadn't really considered before. So the major impact on human uh, well-being, I think, was a conceptual one, not a technical one. And I think that's about what's going to happen now. The, the, the single biggest thing historically was microbial theory. I think we're going to have at least the same impact, not on microbial disease, but on age-related disease in a way that has never occurred because nothing we do right now really affects age-related disease. We put Band-Aids on it. We replace the knees. We put you on, on statins. We do lots of things. But that doesn't change the aging process. And yet the aging process is, is fungible. It's, it's changeable. It's something we can deal with. I see aging as the largest problem in the world. You know, it, it stresses the entire healthcare industry and the economics also. So we wish you the very best. Any moonshot that you have that you would like to share with the audience? No, but I'd like to point out that 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 question about what's the biggest uh, problem, uh, you know, it may be that we're lucky enough to get old enough to age. Many people in the world don't. And there are certain spots I can think of in the Middle East where the concern is not aging. It's simply getting through the next day without violence. Um, and I don't mean to pick on anybody in particular. I just mean to point out that the world is full of lots of unpleasant things. And aging is merely one of those things. Doctor, thank you for taking time being part of the podcast. And I hope that the approach that you're taking for telomere lengthening works and we have a, a intervention that, you know, not just for Alzheimer's that you're going for FDA trials, but also possibly, you know, uh, actually age reversal. And so wish you and the team the very best. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.